Hey, what is up, everybody? It is your girl, Martha D. Staub, owner of MDMC Entertainment, and today is episode 16 of Business Building and Beyond, and I'm so very humbled and honored to have the next guest on the show. Um, he is a multi-talented entertainer, actor, singer. Uh, please welcome the Jeffrey Dolan. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, man. Oh, it's so great to have you on. Uh, I want to thank the Morpha Network for setting this up for that for us. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ryan's a, a real trooper when trying to get these things sorted. So yeah, thank you. How's New Zealand? New Zealand's good. It's coming into summer, um, and uh, we're coming out of our sort of second wave of issues with COVID here. Um, mm -hmm. Announced yesterday that the country's dropping down uh, its levels of, of intensity. So. Um, that's good. So most of the country goes back to what they're just calling level one, which is the only restriction is just no borders open. Mm -hmm. uh, Auckland is staying in level two for another couple of weeks because this is where the latest cluster um, has been based. Um, but we are, compared to the rest of the world, it's we're a blimp on the radar. It's uh, you know, I think we've got sixty something cases uh, wow. nationwide, you know, and um, unfortunately suffered our twenty third and twenty fourth death, you know two weeks ago, which is very sad for the families involved, but, but um, we've been impacted uh, fairly fairly minimally compared to um, other nations such as yourself, um, and so we feel ourselves quite, uh, quite blessed that uh, you know, it's been, been that way. But I think it's taken some pretty hard actions by our, by our leaders to, to get us there, um, and actions that perhaps some other countries may have uh, benefited from if they'd been strong enough to take that, take that course of action, or even the people to support it. I think that's been a big part. I think we've noticed internationally is um, your, your, your leadership is only as good as the people that back them up and, and listen to them and agree that the, the moves are right. And when you've got a, a large dissenting voice, uh, as, uh, as seems to be the situation in the US, uh, it doesn't make things easy at all. And uh, you know, the, the who to blame becomes a massive, massive issue. It's just very interesting here. I feel like we are just the running joke of the world right now. I, I feel at this point, everyone's lining up to take over our leadership. It's just, it is uh, it's very sad. Um, I'm very glad that you guys are doing really well. I wish we could follow in the same suit, but uh, yeah. ironically, ironically, you know, I'm in California. So, you know, here, you know, the masks are, are super enforced. A lot of Californians follow the rules. We have a great governor. Um, but I went back to New Mexico and of course the political thinking is a little different there. Yeah. Um, and everyone's walking around without a mask and I'm just like, Oh my God, like, this is why your numbers are high. And it's, it's all in, and it's sad to say it's, it's not turned into a health issue. It's turned into a political issue. And so I think, I think, that's, I think that's the major part of it for, for, for a lot of countries yeah. it is not a health issue at all. It is literally dissenting voices, conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. uh, um, um, people wanting to challenge the status quo or challenge the truth um, and saying, I don't need to do this. I'm, I'm, it only affects certain people. I'm not one of those people. Um, okay. You're only doing this because you're scared. If you're scared, it means you're weak. I'm not weak. Uh, right. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real, um, yeah, it becomes a, there's no, there's no beating that to be fair. You, you can't change people's, sort of moral position just by saying no look you have to do it because otherwise you might get sick just you know and it's best. crazy because um uh, i work very closely with roger velasco he's one of my clients he's been one of my clients for three years now and uh, i saw him about three weeks ago and we were getting some stuff ready for a promo that we're doing and i had masked up and everything where he lives they're very uh they don't really follow the rule with the, the mask thing, but he contracted COVID and I freaked out because he told me, he's like, look, I'm sick. He missed a very important show. And, you know, me as a manager or whatever, I'm like, why did you miss this? And he's like, I am sick. And I'm like, go get tested, go figure it out. Yeah. Sure enough, he had COVID. And so he didn't release that information until over the weekend. But um, I was very worried. Yeah. <laughs> And I didn't touch him, or I, but I was in very close proximity. So I was like, "Oh my God! Like this could happen to anybody." Yeah, yeah, and and it's and it's important that you now go and get yourself looked after and keep yourself slightly isolated for a while. This has been the big thing here: is mm -hmm. uh, people taking the right steps after they've been in contact with people, uh, because you don't know until you know you don't know you've been in contact with someone, 
you know, there's no way they don't have a sign on their head, you know. So no. but once you once you know you've been in contact, then it's a whole on you to think about the other people that you could affect um, and exactly. step back and isolate yourself for the time that was required to make sure you are clear. Um, not, not just for your own safety, but for the safety of your friends, your family, your grandparents, you know, the, those yeah. that are more susceptible. You know, it's just a, it's just a, a personal responsibility thing that I think a lot of people are being quite selfish about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'm glad you're safe and I'm glad your country is doing well. We hope to be like your country one day. <laughs> but let's get to the, the meat of this. Um, I... I've, I've looked over a lot of your work over the past couple of days and um, I asked, I was actually listening to uh, some of your singing just ah. recently. Um, I, I mean, how, when did you find out in life that you were just talented? Like what was the first stepping stone that got you into entertainment? Um, well, I don't think there was ever sort of a, a I don't think I ever planned it. It wasn't like I had a, a stage mom that directed me towards stuff. <laughs> But I was always I was always involved. I always just liked performing for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got an auntie that will tell you until my possibly um, I my voice broke um, that I couldn't sing a note. You know, uh, mm -hmm. she thought I was tone deaf. Um, and but just before my voice broke, that was in, I, I was in the we call it the third form when I was young. It would be about uh, year seven, maybe grade seventh grade. I um. um I auditioned for a school musical, got into it. Um, unfortunately, got hit by a car and oh my broke, my leg. Yeah, broke my leg in several places. And so I ended up in hospital for six weeks in traction, uh, having my re leg realigned because the bones sort of set like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I came back, of course, the school rehearsals had already happened. And so I, I, I lost the part, but I continued into the chorus. Um, and it turned out to be a bit of a blessing because I was supposed to be playing the Artful Dodger and in, mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in Oliver. And um, during this, during the performance of the, of the show, my voice broke, and I wouldn't have been able to perform the part because I just, I was literally for the last three or four nights of the show, I, I lip synced because my voice was over here, over here. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. But, but with that, I, I then just continued to do school shows because I enjoyed that aspect of things. Mm -hmm. It was just a different. Um, I was very sporty as well. I mean, I was, a, I was an athletics champion and a, and a top rugby player, but I enjoyed that sort of other outlet away from that the, the, the sports jock sort of thing um, into the entertainment. So it sort of was just that initially was a hobby because, <clears throat> to be honest, rugby was my focus. I don't know if uh, you, you or your listeners are, uh, are very familiar with rugby. Um, a, little <laughs> a little bit. So it's, it's like your American football without the pads and, and, and four different teams. Um, playing for one thing it's yeah we, we you have 15 people on the field and they pretty much stay there until the end of the game um and i was going to be an all black uh, which in new zealand means uh, you are representing your country you you, you uh you are the best the best in the country and you play for new zealand against other nations uh, uh we've there's been a couple of all black games at soldier field in, in chicago the last couple of years uh where we actually played the american eagles the american rugby team a couple of years back and then we played ireland there uh, not long ago um, so that was my drive. But then when I played against a few of these All Blacks and realised, man, I'm not quite that level, uh, my focus changed. Yeah. And I got an opportunity to audition for a professional show. And I thought, well, why not? Um, yeah. I enjoyed it. It's a different, different angle. And as soon as I got involved in that side of things, that switch just flipped. And I just went, this is what I want to be doing. Right. Um, initially, it started just in theatre. I did like nine or 10 years solid, just theater around New Zealand. Um, but then the other side of things started evolving out. So started getting TV roles, um, started getting commercials. Um, and then a thing called Theater Sports came into New Zealand. Uh, Keith Johnson from Canada created, uh, 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 copyright, copyrighted the, uh, the word theater sports mm -hmm. and started improvising, which was something not many New Zealanders had really done before. And that, that just opened up a whole new avenue of work, uh, particularly in the corporate market, but also got us working on our characters and different voices and things. And right. but again, that rolled into Xeno Hercules and then into the doing the voicing for uh, the voiceover market and then voicing for things like Power Rangers. So it was sort of a, 
a happy kind of collision of different things that led me towards it as opposed to being a, a, a driven focus I this is what I want to be uh, in my life um, the discovery of my um, true path as opposed to a, a, a drive for it you know they do say that uh, the theater based uh, actors that start in theater are probably the most um, um, already skilled when they get into like a TV role or something like that so uh, yeah it, it definitely helped. Um, because because of theatre, you work so closely on the production as opposed to TV and film, you're a bit more removed from it. You sort of mm -hmm. come in where the majority of the development has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the, in the, in the theatre, you, you work for five, six weeks on the script with the director directly and the other performers directly uh, in, in your rehearsal process. Um, TV and film has very little rehearsal process. To it. You might get together for a read through and maybe have a crack at a couple of more complicated scenes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, you get a whole lot more investment within it. So you, you hear ideas, you work with really, really experienced people and spend a lot of time with them. And so you can garner far more knowledge. Uh, where in a TV and film situation, you might only be in for a day or two. You might be a core character. <clears throat> but some of these experienced people might only flash in and out of the production. And so you don't get that chance to really harvest knowledge. Right. Yeah. Um, I was looking over your IMDb. And um, I'm assuming it's pretty on point because I believe, I think you manage it, right? You're yeah, I, well, IMDb is, I mean, for me, I don't have a huge amount to do with it. It's basically managed by the production companies. They're the ones that upload the information while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, IMDb has been a bit of a blessing because it helps me keep a track of what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must update my CV. Oh, what have I done lately? And they're like, oh, I can look at IMDb. And they'll tell me. So, <laughs> I mean, I have one, and I've had to take care of it myself, and I just haven't paid for the premium to take care of it. So I just I haven't I haven't kept. I only have two credits, but it's a little, like behind the scenes stuff. I'm not an yeah. actor, but um, but you are in probably two of my favorite staples, and not Power Rangers. I'm not talking about Power Rangers. <laughs> I'm talking about Hercules and Xena. I mean, right. yeah. that, I mean that's legendary with the you know the yeah. Kevin Sorbo and you know. Uh, yeah. Lucy Lawless, what was, I mean, were they filming in Australia at that time? Is that where the production was happening? New Zealand, New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand yeah. Australia and New Zealand, very different places. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 3,000 <laughs> kilometers apart, so yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they were, They. I mean, <clears throat> Hercules came into New Zealand, uh, and it was one of the, sort of the original international productions to come over here and test the waters as a, uh, as a venue. There'd been some movies and stuff, but the television side of things had never really been tested. So I took a bit of a risk. Um, and yeah, one that paid off for everyone. You know, Kevin went on to bigger and better things and um, of course, Tina spun out of that and Lucy then you know, married Rob. And you know, that sort of, then really, it really cemented that relationship with it because Rob and Lucy still come back here, live here. Um, they still do productions here. They've made stuff recently um, in New Zealand. So it's really been a kind of a, a great um, connection to have been made. Um, and yeah, they were, Lucy's an old friend from even before um, uh, Zena because she was part of the comedy scene in, in Auckland. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and did a lot of adverts and a bit of TV and lots, lots of its pieces. Uh, Kevin was great to come. He was just so open and so welcoming and he wasn't. He didn't play the star at all. You know, I, I, I'd take him out for golf, and we'd go out to dinners and stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, he's a, he's a mad keen golfer, so I was I was quite popular with him because he was like, "Jeff, I gotta go and play. Where are we going? Where are we going?" So that was that was quite fun. <laughs> I mean, I'm still in communication with him now, and if he ever comes to New Zealand, he gets in touch and goes, "We getting that for a round, man? Come on, come on!" So, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, it's good fun. Um, but it was a real uh, bonus for New Zealand because they they didn't inundate us with lots of international talent. There was there was the regular stars would come over and, uh, and participate and stuff. But overall, the majority of the cast was New Zealand. The majority of the, the production crew were New Zealand. Uh, directors ended up being New Zealand directors in the end. Um, Michael Hurst ended up directing quite a few episodes of himself, right? uh, yeah. and, and playing Elvis at the same time. Uh, and it helped establish quite a few New Zealanders on the international market. You know, Kevin Smith, uh, rest of his soul, um, you know, was on got, heading on to bigger and better things uh, out of his Aries uh, connection. Uh, Joel Tobik, 
uh, doing great work in, in, uh, in various shows, you know, Sons of Anarchy and Hawaii Five-O and bits and pieces mm-hmm. internationally. Um, certainly helped those guys through there, Daniel Cormack and the likes that are still working internationally. So it was, it was a really cool thing and, and, a, and a great show, great fun show to work on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some of the shows were serious, but I, I luckily got to work on a few of them that were a bit more tongue in cheek and a, a bit more comedic, um, moving on to Jack of all trades as well. So yeah, it was, it was a great, great experience. What was your favorite moment with it? I mean, I remember growing up and watching, my mom and dad were very much into Xena. And I, I remember before I knew anything about Wonder Woman, right. um, Xena was just this, I had never seen anyone like her, you know? Yeah, right. A woman who is kicking ass that looks fantastic. I yeah. mean, for me, I was like, "Whoa, this is an icon!" and yeah. and it was just something I gravitated towards. And then, you know, my mom would be watching Hercules. It was funny because my dad was watching Xena, my mom was watching Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I would bounce back and forth. But sure. um, uh, Lucy Lawless, for me, she's you know she's she's an icon to me. I'd love to meet her. I've I've yeah. missed her a couple times, and you know I've seen her in. In various other shows like Battlestar Galactica and things like that, and um, it's just that 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 mental note for me as a woman, as a girl back then, seeing that you know a woman can do these things, yeah. that was empowering. I, I just she she left a, a mark on me in in that way, and you know any any woman can do anything, and it's just you know and it's been very divine that happening is is just as empowering. You know, it was you know, she she was in there for a, a short stay on Hercules. Supposed mm-hmm. to be killed, uh, didn't get killed, and then it was her and another producer friend of hers that really pitched the idea to the production company to create the spin-off. So they really drove their own success, uh, yeah. and I think why she had so much more, um, I would say, following. But she certainly got the, the the fan base was far stronger, I think, on the on the Xena side of things because they saw it as a vehicle that she'd created, and, and it was very empowering for women. And so she got this real. She, not just women, she became this gay icon as well, and and, and uh, it was it was quite quite amazing to see it. And we didn't really sense it here because we saw it on the TV, and it was yeah. a show that Kiwis were in. But that fandom thing in New Zealand is just not a not a strong thing. There's there's a few people that might get recognised and 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 you know get the whoop whoop and no approve your signature. But majority of times, New Zealanders are very sort of leave them be, tall poppy. Mm-hmm. Um, don't want to interrupt. It's just they're just having a day off. It's yeah. Uh, whereas overseas, you know, when the guys went over to do the conventions, the Xena and Hercules conventions, and then the ones that spun out of Lord of the Rings, etc., man, that just completely opened up a lot of these guys' eyes as to hey, the impact that they'd had on the industry and the impact they'd had with fans, which was, you know, they really they came back sort of going, you won't believe what goes on over there, you know? <laughs> yeah, I feel like New Zealand has just been opened up as as a little mini Hollywood where a lot of a fantastic things are being filmed there, and it's because of that landscape. I mean, yeah. you said it's three thousand miles away from Australia. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah three thousand kilometers. Yeah, yeah. So it's a three and a half minute flight. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's just that's a decent distance yeah, yeah. between the two. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've got a major, huge piece of land, and yeah. we're these two little islands, just sort of mm. uh, that sit below it, just almost directly south of it, uh, towards Antarctica. So, and very, very different cultures, very different um, uh, um, views uh, politically and uh, socially, um, uh, very different uh, um, uh, consideration of the uh, of uh, their um, their history and how things went on. So, they were, they were basically uh, established as a as a penal colony back back in the day, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, so they still have that very much that. Um, uh, hidden behind the underdog uh, spirit, which is, <laughs> could get kind of endearing sometimes, but a bit irritating when you're drinking beer with them. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's been on the uh, the wish list of travel spots. And, you know, we keep saying when COVID is over, it sounds like when we win the lottery. <laughs> that's what yeah. it's starting to feel like. But, uh, you know, my father had an, um, a co-worker who um, was from uh, New Zealand and he brought in I remember the the money that they brought in and everything so that's always I remember that as a kid I was like man I, I gotta go down there and see and see what that's about um, it's just yeah, it's, you know, it's, sadly who's, who who knows now I mean I, was, I, I did some traveling last year and probably a bit m- more traveling than I should have uh, considering how the year ended I was, a bit, I was at the end of the year I was sort of regretting 
uh, the amount I'd done and how much I'd spent because uh, financially things got a bit challenging. Yeah. And then when COVID hit, all of a sudden I just forgot about that, you know, and I just went, you know, so happy that I did it because who knows when next I'll <sighs> to head overseas. Mm -hmm. um, need to selected places, you know, there'll be countries that, yes, you can go there freely, but if you go there first, when you come back, you're going to have to spend two weeks in isolation and you're going to be paying for it because that adds to your holiday expenses. So, yeah, yeah the charts of coming to the US any time in the next two years, I think is going to be very restricted or very almost negative. Um, yeah. What we're being sort of um, set up here slowly there's all the massaging sort of thing that probably the borders aren't going to open until 2022 and yeah. that's like actually what we're hearing on um we have several connections into um very large shows in the u.s and yeah. um a lot of the comic cons that are um that are trying to get up and running we're hearing everything is not going to go back to normal until 2022. I started hearing 21 in April, but now it, it's turning out to be 22. And I'm like, geez. Yeah. I've talked with a few of the uh, convention guys over the last couple of months, you know, because they're just interested in knowing whether I want to come over and stuff. And and I've said, yeah, I'm more than happy, but I've, I've got to also weigh that up with whether it's going to be safe to do so as well. I'm, I'm health compromised, I'm asthmatic all my life. Yeah. Um, and so it would be, you know, you know, a silly move for me to think about coming into a place that is still fairly, fairly high risk. Um, and and mm. when you where some of these conventions are on as well, um, you know, Florida, etc., um, it's not not the place that you want to be dashing into. Um, yeah. And for us, you know, there's there's this is plus side for us. It's already happening. Is um, a lot more production is coming into New Zealand because we're a safe place to be. Yeah. Um, Several, you know, the reason I'm bearded at the moment is I'm, I'm filming um, a in a couple of weeks on a US production that's uh, come over here. Um, and they're coming here because they can do full contact, no distancing filming because we're open. Uh, right. A lot of international commercial coming down here and being filmed here for the same reason they can they can film a proper commercial without having to do long range, you know, and can't have the same people in the same shot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's going to have this little spin-off for New Zealand due to our adherence to the rules and, 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 the, and, the, and the way that our, our, our leaders chose to, to tackle it. Um, and hopefully that leads to bigger and better work for, for us while we're here. Yeah. What I love about what you have done yourself is, you know, you have a very strong, very long list of, of roles that you have done over the years. But you've got into the corporate space where you are now emceeing at corporate places. And again, I was listening to your singing. Um, you know, was there a particular moment that spawned that off? Or what was your business thinking on that? Because that's literally starting a business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm part of an Actors Cooperative in Auckland that uh, has been around now for over 30 years. It's established in 1988 uh, out of the theatre sports thing I mentioned earlier um, to create work for other actors and to get this improvisation thing happening. And so theatre sports became very big over here. Um, we were doing shows uh, 24 weeks a year in 500 seat theatre, um, getting 10, 12 people on stage and musicians and lighting operators and, you know, and doing a, a two and a half hour show every week um, at the theatre in Auckland. Um, we got a million dollar sponsorship out of a local bank here to have national sponsored tournament stuff with other, other theatre sports companies around New Zealand. And out of that spun the corporate work. Um, people in the audience started coming to us and saying, I, I don't know if you know theatre sports, it's a little bit like the Who's Line Is It Anyway show, the games they play on that. Mm -hmm. uh, where, whereas well, improv. Sports, yeah, improv stuff. So, so theatre sports is two teams or three teams or four teams playing off against each other, doing those games you see Drew Carey or whoever's hosting it now, leading, mm. doing the arm scenes and the and the the, the, the um, interview scenes and creating songs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so companies started coming to us and saying, hey, could you come to our company? We, you know, Doris from reception is leaving after 45 years and we'd like to honour her in a way and we want to do a little show. And so we, we well, I suppose we could and we come up with what we call just a set. We would do a 45 minute, whose line is it anyway, improvisation, focused around Doris and her, the rest of her uh, workers and she'd be the star of the scene and we'd highlight the other workers and people really loved seeing themselves being portrayed. Um, 
And then we started doing bigger and bigger events. So it started moving into doing awards dinners and yep. then along and entertaining at, at a company conference and at, at their dinner, their conference dinner. Yeah. And out of that, we started seeing the people that were emceeing and hosting these events and seeing how bad some of them were, um, how uh, stuck in the mud they were, how reliant on scripting they were, how they couldn't think in the moment uh, and cope with a glitch that might have happened, a microphone failure or someone asking a bit of a rangy question. Um, and I started going to these event producers and saying, hey, look, we can do that better for you and cheaper. Um, yeah. they, were using, they were using people off the, the weatherman off the TV, you know, and they were using news readers and stuff who are really good with an auto cue in front of them. But when it comes to personality and, and being funny, a lot of them struggled. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so we, we basically spun it around and, and we said we can create characters to MC your event rather than you having to have the newsman. <laughs> you've got a business theme. I'll help support that with a character that supports that. So creating a, a, a game park ranger to help you get through the business jungle, um, being a, an astronaut to help you uh, into the 10 year future view, you know, yeah. um, being being a, a coach to help you, you know, you know go train train your teams up to be stronger teams, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So, and it evolved out of that. And, and I got more skills with understanding how to operate PowerPoint properly and being able to help them build PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, helping them put their AV together because I knew the guys around the country that knew what they needed as opposed to what some salesman from an AV company would try and shove into a, to a venue, an event. And slowly I became able to be a bit of a one-man stop where I could talk to a client and go, I'll talk to the AV people, you guys handle the venue and the accommodation, but I'll get you your keynote speaker, I'll get you the additional entertainment you need for your dinner time, I'll MC it right through because I've been talking with you for the last three months and I know what you need. Um, and Go from, go from there and so yeah it's been a, a it's sort of my main income now uh, the tv and film and commercials and label work um, is something i do as a bit of a treat um, because i can step back and i can if i've got an event on and i saw a big part of the movie or whatever i can step back put someone else into it manage it and go and do my film or tv work and then come back into uh to be, to be honest uh, the corporate entertainment is a whole lot more than the uh, tv and film and commercial work does for far less exposure too. Well, I mean, I think people don't know how to put on events like that. And those those events can be really stuffy and boring. <laughs> and if you do it wrong, it's like the worst thing you could go yeah. to. So yeah. when I was looking over it. I was like, this is inner like, yeah, I would love to go to a corporate event if it was done correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just looked like fun. I mean, just the, the different characters and everything. I, I really did enjoy looking over that website and looking over that because, you I, know, I, help coach the presenters as well so i try and convince them to stay away from powerpoint um i try and convince them to um not put their script on the screen and then just say that verbatim you know and so it's about, i'd rather they just had a picture up there and then talk about you know something that inspires the topic and then talk i mean you're the star people have come to listen to you and your information if they can read it they'll read it and then as soon as they've read it because they'll read it a whole lot faster than you'll say it they switch off and you just lose them. Right. Um, about presenting in the right way. You know, you, so often you go to awards nights and they'll get the managing director up to announce the winner of the top sales prize. Yeah. And the winner, and he would just go and go, and the winner is Bruce Jones. And it's just so uninspiring and unenthused. And it's like, like again, I, I, I say, here's my recommendations. I should do all that, but you guys have the photographs and shake the hands and get the cuddles. Right. And then, yeah. Because I know that Bruce Jones is going to be a whole lot happier when I go, and the winner is Bruce Jones. And everyone goes, no, yeah. not, then the winner is Bruce Jones. Yeah. Um, it happens so often. Uh, back before I was an entrepreneur myself, I did have to bring those events to life. And, you know, having a stuffy CEO do it was just the worst. I, you know, yeah. everyone's like, here's free drink tickets. Like, you're yeah. going to need a drink to get through this. So. Yeah. And, and the only reason for doing it is, oh, we're just saving money. It's like, mm -hmm. how much does this mean to you? Is it if, if you're just saving money, then why do the event? Exactly. Um, you're completely undervaluing what the purpose of the event is. Exactly. So spend some money. Yeah, I, I cost a little bit of money, but you'll get value out of that because while I've done that, the people are leave enthused, they leave excited, they've had some comedy. I sing to them during dinner time so they get that extra level of class to the event. 
And they walk out of the game, wow, that was just so much better than I thought it was going to be. And whatever it cost, it means nothing after that. I mean, your singing voice is just so good. I was I was getting dressed for this interview, and you were singing Sweet Caroline. And so, <laughs> which is funny, I sang that at a bachelorette party, but I was yeah. singing along with you. You just have such a rich, just a hearty voice. It's Thank you, her, like even some of the, the Elvis songs, I was like, man, that is that is on point. I mean, yep. did you take any singing lessons? Did you or are you just naturally that talented? I I I took no I didn't. Um I, I started singing long before I did some lessons. I, my mum my mother determined or well, not determined, uh went, once I started showing this entertainment bent and in my singing, she really had this um strong idea that I was going to be a great opera singer. Oh. And okay. she she hooked me up through a friend with New Zealand's leading opera teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, what had happened was it happened a bit sort of in the wrong order. And if I'd, if I'd been there first, I probably wouldn't be the actor I am now. I probably would be an opera uh, singer and actor. Um, but unfortunately, I'd already started acting. I'd already done stage work and done quite a few plays. And then came in and started working with Emily. And while the her technique and, and it helped me immensely, I was still traveling around the country to go and do shows. And so I couldn't speak with her um, fully. Um, mm -hmm. and, so the, and I didn't want to go to anyone else because why would you go to second best or third best if you were with the best? Um, so I just, I, I, but it didn't grab me either initially. Mm -hmm. Having to read French and Italian and German, I was like, no, I'm not a natural at that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it wasn't, wasn't as sexy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so I fell away from it. So I have had some singing training. Um, but the, the majority of what I do is, is self taught. I didn't go to drama school. Um, mm -hmm. At the time in New Zealand, there was only one drama school happening, um, one public one, there was one private one. And then the universities did courses on drama, but they were more. Um, history based and theory based with very little practical side of it. So I learned on the boards, as they call it, on, on the stage boards. I, um, I, I listened to people, I talked to them, I watched them and, and guarded the bits of advice that I thought suited me and discarded the ones that I didn't think suited me. Um, right. Because everyone has their own style and technique and you can't fit into a prescribed box of this is what you have to do to be an actor. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've seen that you do, you have done quite a lot of work in front of the camera. And then there's been almost like a shift where you've now done more voice work. Uh, what was that preparation like to go from front of the camera to the behind the scenes and just yeah. in front of you? So it was sort of an evolution, really. It came out, we, yeah, because it's a, it, there is a different technique to working with a microphone as opposed to having a microphone follow you around on a TV stick. Or right. Um, and and it, it is something you sort of sort of initially you're sort of going, oh well, it's just I'm speaking and you know knowing how close to the microphone to get and how you can change the modulation of your voice by being quieter, dropping it lower, but being closer to the microphone, um, being further away from the excitement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was a bit of a learning curve in that just through doing normal voiceovers for adverts, etc., for commercials. Mm -hmm. um, and when we first started doing the Power Rangers voice stuff. We had a little bit of previous experience with um, with Xena and Hercules, Jack of all trades, where mm -hmm. we go in and do a bit of ADR stuff for that. Um, and then also was on a Foley team for uh, for Jack of all trades and Young Hercules. Mm -hmm. And so we had a bit of experience working with the microphones and stuff through there. So when the, the Power Ranger stuff started happening voice wise, um, mm -hmm. we'd had quite a bit of training in it and we were far more comfortable with it. Um, and it was then we came which I think the, the stage work and the improvisation work uh, definitely benefited uh, me was um, creating the characters fairly quickly, uh, being, mm -hmm. able to, being able to adjust and switch uh, as a for whatever character you had coming up. And it might only be a subtle difference in dropping it down the throat or taking it into the mouth or adding more of a growl or a howl depending on what your character was. So the difference between Dai Chi being a lion and, and uh, Korag being a wolf was, was yeah. just a change in the throat positioning to, to take it from being a roaring lion to a growling wolf. 
right. and friends with in that way. Um, I've actually, I'm actually auditioning again tomorrow for the next upcoming Rangers. So, wow, I might be back in again. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, Power Rangers now has been filming down in New Zealand for a good while now, and. Um, you know, I feel like it's just, it's a great, I, I kind of hope, I know that Hasbro's now over and I, I, I hope that they continue to film down there. Um, just because uh, It doesn't look like they're going to stop. I, I think they may be trying to aim for, so they came here in 2003. I was, the first time I was involved was 2003. And mm -hmm. my friend, uh, Blake Allen Denport is trying to confirm whether I'm the longest <laughs> franchise um, artist still going with the production because uh, I did my first I did my first role in 2003 and I've been in as an actor yeah. and then started getting voice work um, uh, through it so I, I can't I, I don't remember the number of different um, um, iterations of the show that I've appeared in but it's seven or eight I think uh, okay. and going up so yeah yeah uh, and so, yeah, 2023 could make it 20 years doing the show in New Zealand, which would be quite remarkable. Yeah, no, I think it's an amazing feat. I, I Like I said, I hope uh, Hasbro continues to, to keep that going just because it's just it, it just seems like a great opportunity for those that are wanting to get into acting that can do it there. I mean, um, I'm not sure how big Auckland is with with the entertainment aspect of 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 filming there but i think it's you know any opportunity just to, to give other people that aspiration i think is is more than welcome yeah. and and again a bit like xena and hercules there's a, there's a large content of new zealanders involved in it they mm -hmm. tend to bring in um probably three or four of the rangers are international mm -hmm. uh, sometimes an australian quite often you know, a couple of americans um and then they'll definitely cast a, a local as one of the one of the rangers mm -hmm. usually not all the time, and sometimes there's, there's been a couple in there. Uh, but the, re the, re the support characters that come in are generally all New Zealanders. Um, and I think, as we were talking about earlier with COVID, I don't see them going anywhere else anytime soon because where do you yeah. go? That's safe, you know. Once you've got this base already established, it's, there'd be a whole lot more um, <coughs> protocols and things you'd have to go through to to, re to establish somewhere else because that used to be the situation with Power Rangers. They used to ship country just about every year prior to coming to New Zealand. Yeah. They did a lot of stuff in the Eastern Bloc um, for, for, for a few years. Um, and it was, I don't know whether it was a financial thing or um, just wanting a variety of uh, different, uh, such a variety of uh, sets and opportunities. But um, yeah, so we're very lucky that it stayed here, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a role that you haven't done yet, or you uh, that's that dream role that you uh, are hoping to land at some point? Think goals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, I mean, if you want yeah. to divulge in that, if you don't want to, that's yeah, fine. no, no, no. I mean, I've um, I'd love, I'd love to, and I, and I think as, as it happens with a lot of people, the only way it's going to happen is if I create it myself. And yep. so I've got a couple of ideas for for um. Uh, concepts that would have me as the main focus. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the power. The, so I don't know if you if you watched any of the Almighty Johnsons um, series. It's a New Zealand series. That so on my uh, photograph that I've got out, out there somewhere. There's a character on there called Derek who's from a New Zealand show called the Almighty Johnsons. Okay. Um, and the Almighty Johnsons is a it's a, it's a family and you know, a, a, and a bit of a love story scenario, but the, co the basis of the concept is that there's four brothers who are descended from the Norse gods. Um, the story being that when, as, when they were driven out of Asgard, uh, the Norse gods spread around the world, and some of them ended up in New Zealand. And yeah. over the centuries, as their human forms passed away, their spirit was passed on to the next likely person that would be cut. And so, but over the years, the powers have slowly dwindled and stuff. But mm -hmm. here's the four guys in Auckland four brothers. One of them is Boulder, um, who is uh, lucky with games. One of them is um, uh, Bragi, who is a poet. One of them is, uh, what was what was uh, Jared's character called? Uh, 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 not, uh, ah, what's his name? 
<laughs> anyway, he's the god of ice, anyway. And then one of the characters was Odin. And the, the premise of the show was that the brothers and Odin were trying to find Frigg, uh, the queen, uh, mm -hmm. basically the, the, the female goddess. And if Odin and Frigg got back together, the powers were returned to the gods. That's the basis of the show. Right. And within that, it was all about their brotherly relationships and trying to find girlfriends and where they lived and, and et cetera. But then other gods started turning up. So all of a sudden there's Loki coming and creating trouble because Loki's mm -hmm. a troublemaker. <laughs> all of a sudden they notice this other god, the guy that they think's a bit strange because they think they found Freak. And then two of their, uh, two of their oracles that are with them uh, go, uh, we got to get out of here because that's Thor. Yeah. And Thor is nuts. And I was Thor. Sort of looked like this. Yeah. And, and it was great fun. I got to, I was, I guess there was three series and I had a guest episode in each of the series. That's awesome. And, yeah. And it was great fun. And, and Thor was nuts. And I got to play this absolutely, he, he hated rabbits. He hated giants. Uh, he, he, he loved killing giants. Uh, and he would pretty much just do anything and not worry about the consequences because he could do that. And I could throw my hammer a long, long way. Right. Uh, so it was fun. So I actually I had so much fun with that. I actually pitched a spin off of that series going back because this took place Ooh. in the city. My character was in the country. I thought I said, here's time to go back to the country and have Thor's story with his new family and the gods can come and visit. No problem at all. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the people that Powers of B didn't. I have my faith in that concept just yet, but I think I'm going to pitch it again. You I should. Think yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds interesting. I would watch that for yeah. sure. Um, so, on, um, so you can watch the episodes online um, okay. if, if you just pop in uh, uh, for the Almighty Johnsons. The, the, the clips will pop up, and you can have a look at the content there. I've actually been doing a little spin-off of that um, just to kind of entertain myself and to fill in the COVID. Um, gaps not, and during lockdown, I've been doing uh, Derek's Thor talks. So I've, I've ripped off the TED Talks uh, logo and yeah. got Derek's Thor talks, taking it with PD. And, and it's basically Derek's uh, Thor's ideas on a whole lot of subjects uh, and being very silly with it and, and taking the mickey quite a lot, uh, but also just trying to entertain people. But yeah. yeah. Um, and they're all on uh, YouTube or my Facebook or uh, yeah, other places. Yeah, I'm definitely looking into that because that sounds interesting. Like, I would totally watch it. I think, uh, yeah, don't give up on that. Definitely no, don't. No. Yeah. Well, no, no, the impact it had, <clears throat> I, when I went traveling last year, um, I've, I, two guys, that, well, these two guys in England that created a comic book that I had put up a um, GoFundMe page, and I, and I supported them. They spun out. They thought it was the best thing. And they said, look, we'd love to send you some stuff. And I said, well, I'm actually going to be in England next year. I could come and visit. They were like, what? You'd come and visit? And so I went and visited and had fun with them. Um, and then on the way back, I stopped off in San Francisco. On my last day before I get home, I'm packing, repacking my bag in the foyer of the hotel, talking to the bellhop and the desk clerk. And after about five minutes, the bellhop turns to me and says, sir, have you been on television? And I was like, uh, yeah, back, at, back in my home. He said, were you on a show called The Almighty Johnsons? I was like, yeah, how'd you know that? And he said, I was watching Netflix and I watched the Thor movie and at the end of it, it says, if you like that, you might like this and Almighty Johnsons is there. He said, I've watched the series three times now. <laughs> he says, I heard, your voice. I heard your voice. I was going, I know that guy's voice. Yeah. Why do I and then worked out that it was from The Almighty Johnsons. So it was like a, a wow moment. Um, in San Fran going, okay, oh, this is bigger than I thought it was. So, yeah. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Yeah. Have you, have you ever thought... Yeah, if it's on Netflix, yeah, I'll definitely go look for it. Right. Um, yeah. Have you thought of maybe coaching or, or or schooling someone who has aspirations to go into acting and, and this entertainment sphere? Because I feel like you're you're super talented. You should be sharing your... your your, yeah. your knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always happy to share the knowledge. Um, I just, I think those things you, you require a bit more structure. Not <laughs> 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 oh, structure when it comes to that. I'm, I'm happy to sit down and give people advice and talk mm -hmm. to them. Um, but there are people out there far better um, 
uh, aligned to teach, and teaching is not a strong point of mine, unfortunately. Advising, yeah, I'll talk to you all day, but uh, yeah, teaching, <laughs> yeah, I'm still learning. Well, I think you're you're super busy with the corporate things, and you know you're geared oh, for a new role. <laughs> so I, yeah, maybe that's a little too much of a heavy heavy yeah. dose. <laughs> I do too. I, around Elvis, I've got a great film, Elvis film idea that I'm still playing with, but you know, that's 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 in the secret compartment box. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So you, I mean, you definitely do. You, do you write out these? Do you write out these scripts, or is yeah. this just? I just got an ideas. I got a folder that I wake up with crazy ideas you know, and songs and stuff like that that kind of come into my head, and 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 I just uh, and they'll come to me during the night. Whatever, I'll grab my phone and just start talking at the phone. Um, okay. And and then I'll sit down and get together a bit of a a one pager, a two pager, whatever to sort of get the flow of things going. So mm -hmm. I've got a, a folder on my computer that that gets delved into occasionally when I'm feeling creative. It's not yeah. it's not really full, but it's full of ideas for me to potentially get work. So you and know, I've got a good writing friend who I can go and see when I need to to talk them through. That's the best thing you can do. I don't know how many notes I have all over the place between my phone, my Mac, my MacBook, <laughs> all these <laughs> ideas that I have. It they're never compartmentalized. It's just they're they're scattered. So I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, successful people do that. <laughs> yeah, I was walking. I was literally walking down the street on Saturday evening, heading to a friend's birthday party, having just been at another friend's place for a barbecue, and a song came into my head, and I just started. I just turned my phone onto, on, onto the notes page and started dictating the, the lyrics of the song. So um, I, haven't, I haven't haven't got taken it any further yet, but I've got, I've got to go back and revisit that because I, I can't see it every so often. I go, right, that's no, Thomas. Yeah. You've got to do things when you're feeling uh, inspired. And yeah, so doing it at the time, great. And then keep an eye on them and then the inspiration will come again and then you just fully develop it. So you can't force yourself into a room and make the inspiration happen. It just happens. It happens. Yeah. No, it's a creative process for me. Is it's it's, it's, it's uh, not spur of the moment, but um, but it, it certainly comes to me, and then I I, I let it grow from there. Yeah, that's I, I feel like that's my problem because you know I do have all these great ideas, and then um, when I'm told to do it, then I'm like, let me let it marinate. So this is yeah. why I'm, I'm late on a couple of things because I'm yeah. like, I had a really great idea, yeah. and um, but that's just. Yeah. Usually there's a trigger. Usually there's a trigger that kind of gets you, but you, you, you'll be doing nothing and then something will be said or you'll hear some music or you'll see something and you'll go, man, that's just giving me a great idea. Um, and as I say, quite a few of my things come to me in the night, um, uh, either in dreams or in uh, or in that sort of just that moment before going to sleep when the brain's just starting to calm down and you start focusing on less and less stuff, all of right. a sudden the fear will just jump out and you just go, oh, I've got to do something with that now. Because I'll forget if I wait till the morning. So. Right, right. All right. Well, I think that's about it, Jeffrey. Um, where can people find you at if they want to? Um, you know, probably follow you on social or. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I'm. Uh, I, I, where am I? I'm on um, YouTube. Uh, I think it's just under Jeffrey Dolan. Uh, you could probably search something like um, uh, Kiwi King uh, in, in in Las Vegas. Uh, okay. That's my, one of my tracks. Me singing. Uh, um, in, in the uh, one of the casinos here, just popped yeah. into karaoke. <laughs> so I thought I can't come to Vegas and not do some Elvis. Um, yeah, that's the one yeah. I was jumping out to before we got on oh, here. Okay. All right, Viva okay. Las Vegas, that was great. Yeah, um, I crack up at the guy behind me, the DJ, putting up the on single sign. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Um, also, I've, I've got an official fan page on Facebook uh, at Jeffrey Dolan official fan page. Um, so pop on there. I, I'm on. I am on Facebook personally, but I prefer people that stuck to the fan page. I, that's my friends and family yeah. uh, page. This one. Um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm putting up my uh, direct clips on Instagram at the moment. Uh, yeah. Twitter. Yep. Um, LinkedIn. Don't worry about LinkedIn. That's business. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I'm not a huge user of uh, or, or, or participant in the social media things, so I don't expect piles of content to come flowing out. Um, but when it is there, I'll put it there because I think it's important. So. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I manage a lot of accounts for celebrity talent and and uh, some fans just don't know any bounds 
<laughs> when they talk to people and it's uh, I can I can understand it's very overwhelming sometimes. It's like all right. I don't mind it. I'm pretty good at handling that stuff too. And I'm not shy of telling people to step back if needed. Um but um but yeah, I don't want to upset anyone either. So yeah, I've had a few people trying to friend me on my on my personal Facebook page and I've just left them there. Um uh, so I'm not ignoring you, I'm just ignoring you. So yeah. Right. right. Awesome. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for being a part of my show today. It is a true honor. You're just, you're thank so you. talented. I just, I'm, I'm beaming. It's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. for uh, so, uh, Thank you for having me on your show. And I wish, uh, I wish all your uh, followers all the best as well. Uh, stay oh. safe. Be well, please. Uh, look yeah. after each other. Be kind to each other. Uh, that's the most important thing. And hopefully, uh, no matter who's in charge, some yeah, you know, something will come about that sort of sorts us out for everybody, um, and and we all get back to a, a level of normality that would be nice to achieve. Well, as soon as we're getting normal, I'm getting on a plane and just going to go travel, and I don't know when I'm coming back. That's that's the feeling I have. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the Pacific Islands to open up because I I had a whole pile of um, airfares booked, which are now just credits with the airline. So mm. as the uh, as soon as the uh, Pacific Islands open up. Uh, Fiji, Rarotonga, uh, Samoa. Um, that's where I'm going because I think that's going to be our first destination because they are completely clear and they're just waiting for us to be completely clear. So as soon as that can happen, that's where I'll be. I'll be in the sun and in, in, in Samoa, maybe. Yes. All right. I, I, you know, and I live in San Diego. I live in a in a in a tourist destination, but yeah, I've been to San Diego. I, I need to be somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> in 2003, came over there to do a theater sports international conference. So it's, been, mm. it's a lovely place. It's beautiful here, but um, I'm ready to, to go out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Go follow Jeffrey on all of his social media, and we will see you in the next episode. So bye. Thanks, Martha. Bye-bye. Thanks.